Good morning. Welcome to this morning's worship service. A very special welcome to you if you happen to be a visitor with us today. If you're a first time visitor, we'd be delighted if we could welcome you more formally, if you'd be willing to stand up and introduce yourself. Uh, do we have any first time visitors willing to stand up and introduce themselves? Okay, I'm gonna direct your attention then to your uh, church bulletin and while I do that, those of you sitting in the pews closest to the Burgundy worship folders, if you haven't already, I would invite you to go ahead and take those out now. Begin to put your information in there. Uh, just a reminder, uh, there are prayer request slips inside. Oops, just turned off my mic. Uh, inside the folders, so if you have a prayer need, go ahead and fill out one of those prayer request slips and um, hang on to it. And then as you leave worship this morning, by the front doors, there's a box with uh, praying hands on it. It's on top of a pedestal there. You can put your prayer requests in there and they'll be gathered by our prayer ministers and prayed over throughout the week. If you would like some private prayer time with one of our prayer ministers, then at the conclusion of today's service, just gather here at the altar rail closest to the pulpit. Someone will be glad to meet you there and to pray with you. Also inside the folders are those uh, blue uh, information cards, uh, as we've been announcing the last few weeks, we're updating our database here at the uh, church and we would really like you to take the time and the effort to go ahead and fill those out as completely as you can. And then there's a box on the welcome table right by the front doors where you can leave those as uh, you leave this morning. Um, let's see, we want to lift up in our prayers uh, those known to have been hospitalized, Fred Souther. We also want to extend our Christian sympathies to the family of Marcy Rainey. Uh, Marcy's memorial service was here at the church yesterday. Uh, on the back page, I just want to lift up to you uh, altar flowers today, uh, given by Lorna Cronenberry, Cr Cronerberry in honor of husband John's 80th birthday and uh, uh, Norma Bauer in memory of husband Clyde. Okay, um, I just wanna encourage you to read through your bulletin carefully, and uh, if you need to, take it home and mark your calendar accordingly. But for now, I invite you to go ahead and stand as you are able, and we'll quiet our minds and center our hearts and prepare to come into the worship of our Lord. We begin our worship this morning on the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, full of compassion and mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Trusting in God's promise of forgiveness, let us confess our sin against God and one another. Eternal God, our creator, in you we live and move and have our being. Look upon us, your children, the work of your hands. Forgive us all our sins and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, our refuge and our strength. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Christ died for us while we were still sinners, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins.
from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace be with you all. and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Let us pray together. You are great, O oh God, and greatly to be praised. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Grant that we may believe in you, call upon you, know you, and serve you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. The reading is from Romans seven fifteen through 25. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want. But I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law. That is good. So it is now no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord.
This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 11th chapter. So Jesus said, But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, you did not mourn. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Now at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Ken Blanchard is a business management expert. He's also the author of the bestseller, The One Minute Manager. Um, Ken Blanchard has a quote, it goes like this. People with humility do not think less of themselves, they just think about themselves less. On the internet, you can quickly find any number of lists of important qualities of effective business leaders or important qualities of effective pastors, and, and almost every one of those lists will include this very important quality or trait, and that is humility. Now, I am certainly not claiming to be a profoundly humble man, but one thing does seem clear to me, at least today, and that is this, that God has made me a more humble man through the experience of being a pastor. That God would want me to be more humble really comes as no surprise. You see, I know that the Lord loves me. And I know that the Lord wants me to live up to my greatest human potential. And I know that, uh, that God understands there is one thing standing between me and true greatness, and that's me. I don't know about you, but I can relate to today's reading in Matthew's Gospel not only because Jesus is speaking about burdens, and we all carry burdens in life, but, but also that he promises that if we follow in his example, if we seek to learn from him, that our earthly journey will be less difficult, less painful, less cumbersome. And, and the point he makes to us is, is that one of the things that you can do to make life so much better for yourself is to follow his example of being gentle and humble in heart. Now, we all have our burdens, and we all, you know, some of them big, some of them small, but I wonder if you've ever thought of pride as being one of the burdens that you bear, or lack of humility as a burden. 
And what I'm suggesting to you this morning is, is that one of the most destructive burdens that we might ever face in life is this burden that results from human pride. It's probably why it's listed in those lists of the seven deadly sins. Human pride, or um, sometimes what causes pain in our life is the self-centered pride of others. But if it's our pride or the pride of someone else, certainly it can cause a great deal of difficulty in our life. And, I, and my point is simply this, for us to have a mature faith and for us to, to be walking closely with Jesus, we eventually need to get this thing figured out about how to have a healthy balance in our life between, between pride and humility. And some of you know of what I speak. Some of you know that human pride can be a burden, that it can really mess things up. And, and I think it, it is that we just start to thinking sometimes because of our pride that, that God owes us something. And, and the reason that God owes us something is because we have been so faithful to God. So that's, that's one thing we, we face as, as Christians, those of us who have walked closely with the Lord, is, is that the Lord owes us something. But there's also another tendency, and, and that's the way, uh, the tendency that we have of looking at the world sometimes uh, in two ways. And, and that is, is that the, the, there are two ways to do things, and, and that is my way and the wrong way. Have you ever... You know, and, and Frank Sinatra loved that song, My Way, you know. And, and he really extolled the virtues of life and doing things my way. And what I'm suggesting to you is, is that when we spend our life trying to always do things our way, usually at the expense of others, it doesn't end up very well for ourselves and for other people. And then we fall victim to pride because we don't give God the credit where credit is due. We take credit for things that aren't due us. And we start to see the world through our own eyes and not through the eyes of others. Now, the opposite of pride is humility. For many of us, me included, uh, humility is a rather elusive virtue. The fact is, they say, once you have humility, once you think you have humility, you don't, right? Maybe you've heard the story of the man. He received a medal for being so humble, but then they had to take it away from him because he got caught wearing it, you know? <laughs> yeah. What scripture is clear is this. When it comes to humility, God loves a humble heart. And oh, the things that God will do to keep us humble. I remember an incident that occurred during my seminary internship in northern Minnesota. Um, I, you know, you, you, on internship, you learn the ropes. So it's the first time you're sort of thrown to the wolves. Not like you're really wolves, but, <laughs> you know, you feel like sometimes you're thrown to the wolves. And, and so you're leading worship and uh, for the first time for a lot of folks and, and, you know, just trying to really get things figured out. And I remember I'd been there probably four or five weeks and I was really starting to think, you know, I'm, I'm going to get a handle on this thing. I think I can really pull this off. And uh, I would meet on a regular basis with my internship committee and wonderful people. And uh, one of the people in the congregation I respected the most was on this internship committee. And while I was meeting with them, she looked at me rather sheepishly and she said to me, she said, you know, Jack, you don't have to chant the liturgy. <laughs> you notice I don't chant the liturgy too much around here. It's not really my strong suit, apparently. I thought, it, I thought I was doing okay, but apparently not so much. That was a humbling experience. 
Yes, indeed, God tries to keep us humble, and for good reason, because I think God knows the destructive power of human pride and arrogance. The interesting thing in Scripture is, is Scripture says that God hates prideful arrogance. And you would think that's a pretty strong term. You, you know, you think maybe it would be, well, you know, God is irritated by our pride, or God is frustrated by our pride. But it says in Scripture, in Proverbs chapter 8, I hate pride and arrogance. And I would suggest to you, if God hates it, then there's got to be a good reason for it, and we should take notice of it. In fact, in Proverbs 16, it says, pride goes before destruction. Or the common way we put that is pride comes before the fall. So maybe one of the reasons why God hates pride so much is he knows if you, if you let pride reign in your life, that eventually you're going to take a nosedive. And, and it's true, you know, isn't it? The, the higher you get up on that pedestal or let people put you up on that pedestal, the greater the fall. In Proverbs chapter 15, it says, The Lord tears down the house of the proud. So... God is so serious about pride, and he hates pride so much, and he knows the destructive power of pride so much that he will actually intervene in our lives. And when necessary, he will tear down the house of the proud. So God hates pride. He hates arrogance. And, and really the reason why is this. Ultimately, pride and arrogance are just forms of idolatry. Remember the Lord said in the commandments, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. But when we fill ourselves with pride, our tendency is to start, like I say, not giving God credit for the things that are due God and starting to take credit for ourselves for things that don't really belong to us. And we start to pump ourselves up and then we begin to take credit for the things that are godly in our life. It reminds me of the story of Moses, you know, when when he went to the rock and hit the rock with the staff of Aaron and, and the rock uh, poured forth water out in the wilderness. And apparently Moses, you know, it was, it was, the people had been mumbling and grumbling and they'd been at real pain, right? So, you know, he just kind of took advantage of the moment. Everybody was really impressed finally about something. And Moses decided, well, he'd take a little bit of credit for it. Interestingly, what was the one reason why Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land? Was because of his pride at that moment. Boy, God must have really taken that seriously. You think of what Moses went through for those 40 years in the wilderness, and God said, that thing so irritated me when, when it was my works that gave the people water, and you took ownership of that, well, okay, Moses, that's fine, but you will never see the, the promised land. You, he saw it from a distance, but he didn't enter it. Apparently, God thought that was a big deal, and, and we should take note of that. Arrogance and pride tempt us to think we are responsible for those things that God has done for us. And so we start to take credit for that and not give credit to God. And the result is a heart that is no longer filled with gratitude. Because why do we need to thank God for what we've accomplished for ourselves? In short, a self-made person is merely a fool. A fool who doesn't have sense enough to give God credit where the credit is really due. Author Max Lucado explained the danger of human pride this way. He said, self-pride swells our heads and shrinks our brains. And pretty soon we forget. We forget that we were made out of dirt. And we forget that we were rescued from sin. However, with the same intensity that God hates pride and arrogance, Scripture tells us that God loves humility. Jesus said, all who make themselves great will be made humble. But all who make themselves humble will be made great. 
Scripture also says, as pride comes before the fall or destruction, so humility goes before honor. And with the humble is wisdom. And finally this, God crowns the humble with salvation. So God hates pride, but God loves humility. And God has given us a prescription to help us to replace the arrogance and the pride in our life with a humble heart. And so this morning, that's what I want to do, is just briefly share with you five what I call hints for a humble heart, straight from the pages of Scripture. So the first thing you want to do if you're trying to get a, a, a handle on this pride thing in your life is the first thing you need to do is assess yourself honestly. You know, that's not always easy to do. Um, I liked what uh, our first lesson for today was. That was Paul assessing himself honestly. Here's the greatest evangelist in the history of the church, and what's he saying? I want to do the right thing, but I keep doing the wrong thing. And ultimately he says, oh, what a wretched man I am. Now, if anybody could stand up on a big pedestal and say, look what a great man of God I am. Look what I have accomplished for the glory of the Lord. It would have been Paul. I mean, Paul was beaten, stoned, nearly put to death, in prison. He'd suffered greatly for God. He carried the gospel message to all kinds of different places in the world. He'd made so many sacrifices for God. He certainly, you think, would be one who deserved to be put up on a pedestal, and he could have easily put himself up on that pedestal. But instead, what he says is, look at me. I should know better. I do know better. And yet, this is... This is who I am. It's Paul who wrote, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. A constant reminder of our true human condition. The truth is, no one is perfect. Not even you. And most of us are not even nearly as good as we think we are. And so it's very important for us to recognize that in any given situation, we're probably not as smart or probably not as right as we think we are. That, husbands, is why God gives you a wife. <laughs> Assess yourself honestly, and if you can't, ask your wife okay. or your kids. Number two, give credit where credit is due. Here's a scriptural warning. Do not say to yourself, my power and the might of my own hand have gotten me this wealth. But remember, the Lord your God, for it is God who gives you power to get wealth. You know, there's so much in our, in our culture that talks about this whole thing of a self-made man, and, and a lot of people make a big deal about that, you know, whether, you know, whether or not somebody got some money to get started or whether somebody started with absolutely nothing. And, and all I'm saying to you is no matter where you are in life, you are where you are. You've gotten what you've gotten because God has allowed you to get it. And it's so easy for us to forget about that when we put in our blood, our sweat, our toil, our tears. And then we could so easily slip into this wanting to take credit for these accomplishments in our life. But remember, the Lord gives, and it also is the Lord who takes away. One person put it this way, a wealthy person should always ponder their success and count their money while standing in a cemetery. That way they will be reminded that no one can take their money or their success with them. Boy, isn't that a reality check? This is what scripture says, is basically that, that well, here, here's another one that, that um, you may have heard before. You will never see a U-Haul being towed behind a hearse. And, and here's the reality. It is naked we came into the world. It is naked that we will return. 
I mean, if, you, if, if it was really yours, if you really earned it, then you should be able to get to take it with you, don't you think so? But guess what? You don't. So it isn't. And it's about time we just come to grips with that. I know that many of you have worked very hard and toiled. And, and you know, my, my father worked 60, 70 hours a week, um, you know, trying to send his kids to college and, and, and to give my mom a, 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 a place to raise her children and to provide for us. Uh, you know, if, if anybody could sit and brag about what a hardworking guy he was and how it was all up to him, it would have been my father. But the truth of the matter is, my father had a lot of help along the way. And the truth is, all of us had a lot of help along the way. First of all, God was there. Second of all, there's always people pulling strings. And more often than not, we don't even know the people are there that are doing it. It's just God working in the background. The Bible says, as they came from their mother's womb, so they will go again. Naked as they came, they shall take nothing for their toil, which they may carry away in their hands. So, so far we've received these hints for a humble heart. First of all, assess yourself honestly. If you can't do that, have somebody assess you honestly. And then, secondly, give credit where credit is due. The third hint for a humble heart is, and this is an interesting one, celebrate the significance of others. The Apostle Paul writes, in humility, consider others better than yourself. Yeah, I got a kick out of this thing. When uh, uh, President Trump uh, was, I think he was a, a candidate at the time, wasn't even president yet. But, you know, he was sharing with us how much money he makes and how much money he has and trying to convince us that he was worth so much. And other people were saying, you know, well, no, he's not worth that much. And, and uh, is it Mark Cuban? Uh, he came out, and all of a sudden there was this little snotty back and forth between uh, Trump and Cuban. And it was all about, Cuban said, oh, Trump wasn't a self-made man. You know, he got a loan from his father, but I'm, I'm a real billionaire. I did, you know, because I did. And the reality was they were both so full of themselves, and they were both so wrong, and neither of them really got it that they are where they are because God has blessed them. And, and while they're busy fighting with one another about what self, great self-made men they are, they are basically grieving the heart of God because they're not giving God the credit where credit is due. And then they turn it into a little tit for tat and this messy little thing between each other. And, and it's easy to, I mean, that's a big example that because it was all over the news. But don't think we don't do it ourselves. And oftentimes we'll look at the, the benefits of others or the fortunes of others. And instead of celebrating what they get, we have envy in our heart. Or we think, why do they get that? They don't deserve that. I've done this. I deserve that. It, and, and God says it just, it just spoils and poisons your heart. You should be, he says, when one member of the body excels, it excels on behalf of all. We should be able to sit down and celebrate with one another our successes, just as we share with one another our sorrows for when things don't go well. Life is a team effort. It always is a team effort. We get a lot of help from folks along the way. We get a lot of help from God along the way. We there sure, therefore, we should be content to applaud the efforts and the successes of others. As one schoolboy said, he came home from school. Uh, they were having the tryouts at school for the big play. And mom was really you know, really excited because she, she was really hoping that little Junior was going to get a, a really important part. 
And, and, and he came home and he was so excited. And he said, Mom, I got this great part in the play. And the mom, she's really feeling pumped up. She's really proud. And she says, well, son, what is it? What, what part did you get? And, and he said to her, I've, I've been chosen to sit in the audience and clap and cheer. And my question is, when you are given the opportunity to clap and cheer for others, do you take it? The fourth hint for a humble heart is, don't demand your own parking place in life. Now, I say this rather sheepishly, because uh, a, a couple months ago, uh, I arrived at work and the office informed me that they had indeed put up a sign at the far end of the parking lot reserved for pastor. Now, in, in my entire life as a minister, I had never had a reserved for pastor place, and probably for good reason. <laughs> but the thing about it was, it was out of the kindness of their hearts. It was because of my rheumatoid arthritis and all the problems I was having, and it was especially for on Wednesdays when we have WOW. When we have WOW, there's not hardly a parking space anywhere in the building. But the only parking spaces that are ever there when I get here at noon, you know, that's usually when I get here for work, noon, <laughs> or, or 11.30, you know, WOW hasn't gotten out yet, you know? So, so I have to, you know, sometimes I've had to park down by the casitas down there, and, and they were feeling sorry for me. And, uh, and so they, they had Denny put up a sign that said, you know, reserved for pastor, and I appreciate it. So I, I say this, rather sheepishly, do not demand your own parking place in life. <laughs> Jesus said to the disciples, go sit in a seat that is not important. He's talking about if you go to this big function, right? He says, when you get there, don't assume anything. Go and sit in a seat that is not important. Then he says, when the host comes, he will say to you, friend, move from there to the more important place where you, where you belong. And then he says, then everybody else will see that and respect you. Blaise Pascal, the philosopher, once said, do you want others to speak well of you? If you do, then never speak well of yourself. I tell you, if you have to sit around and convince people about how great you are, first of all, you've got some real insecurity issues, huge insecurity issues. But the other is, you know, if, if, if you have to work overtime to convince me how great you are, I'm not buying it. You know, show me. People should be able to look and see your achievements without you having to blow your own horn. We are called and encouraged to follow in the example of Jesus. Did Jesus sit around and blow his own horn? Did Jesus seek the place of honor and glory? What Jesus chose was the path of a humble heart. What Jesus did was he took upon himself the sin of the world. What Jesus did was he died the death of a common criminal, and he did so, what was his throne? It was the crown of the cross of shame. So that each of us might benefit from his humble sacrifice. This is the example that Jesus gives us. We should live in that example. So we've received these hints so far. Assess yourself honestly. Give credit where credit is due. Celebrate the significance of others. Don't demand your own parking place in life. And the fifth and final hint for a humble heart is this. Live at the foot of the cross. Paul once wrote, May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you sometimes feel like you need some affirmation? Does your self-esteem need a little attention now and then? I know mine does. But God wants us to know that we don't need to try to impress others with our status or our wealth or our personal achievements in order to get the pat on the back that we need. All we really need is one thing in order to be reminded of just how important and how special we really are.
The good news for us today is that the creator of the world, the sun, the moon, the stars, putting all that stuff in the earth, this same God thinks we are so important that he would rather die for us than live without us. Isn't that amazing? I mean, did you ever think that you were so important that somebody might actually be willing to die for you or want to die for you? I want you to understand you're so important that God gave up his own son on the cross so that he could spend eternity with you. And if you had been the only sinner in the world, Jesus would have gone to the cross just for you. We don't need any more affirmation than that. Our God, our Creator, who knows us better than anyone else, says you are so valued, you are so special, you are so treasured, that I would suffer the humiliation of the cross to spend eternity with you. Five hints for a humble heart. Assess yourself honestly, give credit where credit is due, celebrate the significance of others, do not demand your own parking place in life, and live your life at the foot of the cross. So I'm gonna close my sermon with this final story. It's a reminder of how the burden of pride can infiltrate and infect any heart. There once was a young pastor he was rather full of himself. Actually, uh, he fancied himself to be a pretty good preacher. And one day, you know, he and his wife, they were on vacation, and uh, you know, when you're on vacation, you don't wanna necessarily worship in, in your place of worship, because then you're not on vacation anymore. So um, he decided he would go to the next town over, and he would, he would worship in, um, the church of one of his colleagues. Now, Pastor Don will tell you, uh, you know, pastors can be some of the worst critics in the world of other pastors. That's terrible, but it's true. And he was sitting there listening to the sermon of his colleague, and throughout the sermon, he was like Don over there taking notes. <laughs> but at the conclusion of the service, you know, yeah, he, he was thinking the whole time, you know, how, how much better he could have written that sermon or preached that sermon or what he would have done with it instead of that person. And, and so they get done with the service and they get in the car and they're, they're driving home and the young pastor turned to his wife and he asked, he said, honey, do you know how many really good preachers there are in this country? And she smiled and replied at him, I know there's one less than you think. <laughs> so may we walk in the humble footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we never cease to marvel at the fact that as foolish and sinful as we are, Christ loves us so much and treasures us so much that he was willing to die for us. If he's willing to die for us, we should be willing to live humbly for him. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds humbly in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. This time I invite you to stand as you're able. We'll sing our hymn of the day softly and tenderly, Jesus is Calling.
Christian brothers and sisters, let us express our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and died in the Spirit. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let us now share the peace of Christ with one another. be seated. The ushers will now come forward and receive our tithes and offerings. May, we, may all we give be in accordance with what God has placed upon our heart.
huddled together in the Spirit's embrace, let us pray for the mending of God's world. Loving Father, your word says that you will frustrate those who are wise in their own eyes and that you oppose the proud, but give grace to the humble. We confess that we have been self-absorbed and filled with what the world calls accomplishments. We fall to our knees before the cross of Christ and ask that you rid us of earthly pride. We know that in order to receive godly wisdom, we must meditate on your word with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we ask that you guide us in what is right and teach us to humble ourselves as Christ humbled himself. Show us through Christ's example how to live each day in service to you and to others. Give us hearts of generosity so that all we have and all that we do are done to bring you the glory. Lord, in your mercy. Healer and Redeemer, we lift up Fred Souther, who has been hospitalized. Let him feel your healing touch. Comfort the family of Marcy Rainey and all who are grieving losses of any kind. Extend grace and mercy to all those we silently name in our hearts at this time. Lord, in your mercy. God of all creation, protect our dry lands from forest fires. We thank you for the merciful rains that we so desperately need and ask that it would continue. We pray for those who have lost their homes to fires around the country and ask for protection of first responders and our military. We live in a war-weary world, and so we ask that you open the hearts and minds of world leaders to heed the cries of all people who suffer at the hands of tyrants. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your care through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power. Receive the Lord's blessing. May God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine, grant the gifts of faith and hope. And may Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forevermore. Amen.